The first uh, piece that I want to read to you is from C.S. Lewis. Listen closely. Uh, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures uh, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. C.S. Lewis. This next one, kind of interesting, uh, came from uh, Today in the Word, uh, all the way back in 1988, June of 1988. Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. was a member of the United States Supreme Court for 30 years. His mind, wit, and work earned him the unofficial title of the greatest justice since John Marshall. At one point in his life, Justice Holmes explained his choice of a career by saying this, I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. You know, there's joy in ministry. I'm just going to say that. Um, You know, uh, there are a lot of pastors out there. There are a lot of uh, church members, not necessarily this church, but people in general who go to church, who profess to be Christians, and if they ever cracked a smile, I think the world would fall apart um, because you'd think that they were miserable their whole lives. I want to talk to you a little bit about joy this morning, and I want to share a testimony about a gentleman by the name of Ayup Tofi. Ayub Tofi, uh, in his day, in South Africa, was a very well-known uh, gangster. He's a young man. He was involved in a crime that uh, ultimately caused the death of uh, two people. And he was charged with that murder. And prior to going to um, trial, he gave his life to the Lord. And he went to trial, and he was sentenced. And he was miserable because he knew that when, once he went to trial, the evidence was overwhelming. There was no way that he was not going to be sentenced for this crime. Just praying for a sentence that would be reasonable in the sense that he might at some point in his lifetime be able to get out of prison. He was married. He had children. He was sentenced in South Africa Uh, there is not a death penalty. He was sentenced to two life sentences plus 16 years. I had the pleasure of meeting Ayub uh, back in, I'm going to say, it could have been as early as 2005, 2006, somewhere in that area. I I can't exactly remember. And he was at um, Deep Kloof, which is the big prison in um, Johannesburg. Ultimately, he has been transferred to a prison called Leakoop, which is really not a good place. I've been there as well. But here's the thing about Ayub. Instead of wallowing in his misery, instead of getting involved in the gangsterism that takes place within the confines of the prison, he chose to find joy in Christ in the circumstance in which he was in. And so what has he done? He has gone, he has gotten a master's degree in theology. Uh, He is teaching Bible study. He is teaching Bible as a whole within the confines of the prison system. He, uh, when I have visited, um, it's been a couple of years since I've been there. The last time I got to have some one-on-one time with him, Um, and uh, just sat and talked, and he is uh, focused on bringing the gospel throughout the entire prison system 
of South Africa. There are 200, I'm going to say 252 prisons in South Africa. Why do I bring his story to you? He's hoping to get paroled. I don't know that that will ever happen, um, but he is hoping and prayerful that his changed life would be enough for them to give him a parole. Um, But he has also reserved himself to the fact that if it is in that place that he must stay, then he is going to be a light amidst the darkness. And so the joy that he has in Christ overshadows the circumstance that he is living in. Why do I bring this to you? Because we have a tendency to wallow in the misery of a circumstance instead of looking out beyond and seeing the joy of who Jesus Christ is in our lives, not just today, but all the way into eternity. All through life, we look for and try to experience joy. It's what we do. Are you happy? Right? Everybody wants to say, are you happy? I ask my wife all the time, is everything okay? Are you happy? Is everything good? You know? I, I, ask, I ask people that on a regular basis. My question to you is, what does joy look like in your life? What does it look like? Everybody has a different interpretation of joy. This morning, um, to continue our series in Advent, over the past two weeks, what we did was parallel Old Testament um, passage with a New Testament passage. The first two weeks, we were in Isaiah and Matthew. We are going to continue our trek in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Why? Because his prophetic word that God gave him in not only talking about the coming of the Lord the first time, but also talking about the coming of the Lord a second time. And we are going to talk about that this morning. Our New Testament parallel uh, passage is going to come from Luke. And so we are going to be in Isaiah chapter 35, the entire chapter, verses 1 through 10. And then in Luke chapter 1, verses 47 through 55. And so that's where uh, we are uh, going to be. Let me read in Isaiah chapter 1. um, Just, uh, it it won't take me long. I I, got to read God's word. I can't can't not uh, get away without doing it. The wilderness of the desert will be glad, and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The uh, recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah um, will occur. Um, The scorched land will become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water in the haunt of jackals, its resting place, grass becomes needs and rushes. A highway will be there, a roadway. And it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way. And fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. That's God's word in Isaiah chapter 35 verses 1 through 10. Man, 
I don't know if that doesn't get you excited about the joy of what is yet to come. I don't know what possibly can. And so what's going on? This is really in my, and looking, there's a lot of uh, discussion that goes on uh, from a background standpoint about uh, chapter 34 and chapter 35 uh, tying together. I believe it is. It, chapter 34 talks about uh, the vengeance and so on. Chapter 35 really talks about God's rest restoration uh, in terms of what is uh, going uh, to take place. In Isaiah, we see the prophet speaking from an eschatological, I've used that word quite a bit of late, but he's speaking from, uh, in an eschatological uh, term uh, that deals with uh, the millennium. Okay, and so that's a whole nother theological discussion and doctrine and everything we're not, we don't have time for, uh, but he's talking about the millennium. He's talking about the thousand year reign of Christ on earth and uh, the second coming of Christ and what it will look like for those who are believers. And I have to use the word believer because you, if you don't believe in Christ, this is not for you. I don't know how else to put it. However, if you give your life to Christ, the promise is real. It's real. And eternity is yours with him. And so it goes on. It's, not for, it's only for those who are believers. In Luke, as we get to Luke, we step back and anticipate with Mary the first coming of the Savior. Uh, she knew the Old Testament scriptures, even as a young girl. She knew, and God recognized that about her. And uh, interestingly enough, there's a whole lot of debate, um, and, and I'm not looking to uh, stir something up that doesn't need to be stirred. Uh, however, um, Mary uh, is, uh, is, a, is a big debate within Catholicism and with the worship of Mary and all of those things that go on. And so from a scriptural standpoint, what, what I can tell you is that not in one single verse within the confines of the Bible does it talk about the worship of Mary. Not in any place, okay? And so I'll just leave it at that without going deep into it. Um, but she, was, she found favor with God. And, and God, listen, if Mary was sinless, then she would have been with God at the beginning. But in chapter one of the Gospel of John, it doesn't say in the beginning was Mary. It says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. They're talking about Jesus Christ. Okay? And so all of that said, but Mary obviously an, an intricate part of what we see in terms of God becoming fully man. The God-man. The second part of the Trinity. So, um, she finds favor with God's salvation. Listen, salvation will come to all who believe in the Messiah. Even to Roberto, we promise salvation to all. That is God's word uh, to each and every one of us. I've got three points for you this morning. The joy to come which we'll cover in Isaiah, uh, the entire uh, chapter, uh, really. And uh, then our second point is joy in life today. Always difficult to find joy in life today. Amidst all of what it is that we're dealing with in our lives, whoo, how do you find joy, <laughs> right? But uh, that is going to actually cover verses 3 and 4. I'm going to mix it up. I, usually I go every single verse, but I think it's important to understand that in the first point, we're going to cover uh, really uh, verses 1 and 2, uh, verse 5, and then verses um, 6 and 7, and 8 through 10, and we're going to come back in our second point to cover verses 3 and 4. Okay? A third point is going to shift us to the gospel according to Luke. And in our third point, we're going to talk about the joy of Mary to God. The joy of Mary to God. And so I have, I have a lot of notes written all over the place, so I, I, I want to be able to uh, be respectful of everybody's time, but um, we're in the third week of Advent. 
And we talked about a house of hope. We talked about a house of peace. And this morning, our sermon title is A House of Joy. And we need to have joy in our house. Our house right here at Sawdust Road Baptist Church. Our house at wherever it is that you live. We're going to examine the joy to come and the joy that has been given to us in the house of joy. Let's take a look at the first two verses, okay, of chapter 35. The wilderness and the desert will be glad. So immediately we understand, if you think about the desert, I I think um, Russ and Jack haven't been there with me, but when I go to the northwest corner of um, of Kenya in a place called Turkana. It is what's known as the Rift Valley, but it is the northwest corner. So there are parts of the Rift Valley that are flourish, right? But this is all desert up there. Nothing grows except tumbleweeds and thorned uh, thistle bushes. That's about it. There's no water. People walk anywhere from 12 to 15 miles a day just to fill up with water. Okay, so when he's talking about the wilderness and the desert will be glad and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom. The Arabah is an area that is south of the Dead Sea Basin. It is desolate. And in the first verse of this chapter, Isaiah is talking about this desolate, dead area blossoming. It's unbelievable. Things will be so good that the desert will actually be glad. What, what Isaiah is doing is he's talking about the second coming of Christ at this point. Okay? The, 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 this is such an, an, an intricate part of who we are. That, to the point where the deserts will be so glad that they in themselves are going to rejoice. Be glad. It is a symbol of righteousness and peace on earth. In verse 2, it will blossom profusely and rejoice with the rejoicing and shout of joy. How many of us have ever been exiled to the desert in your life and been able to shout for joy over being exiled out? I bring back my friend Ayub, right? He was, listen, he, he's dealing with the consequences of his actions. But instead of a digging deeper hole for his life, getting involved in prison life, he has chosen to find the joy of Christ in his circumstance. I, per, I, I, I can't help but to charge you up and say to you that no matter what your circumstance is as a believer in Christ, you can find joy. You can find joy in such a way that you can rise above the difficulties that you are living with. And we all have our own, our own issues that we deal with. In, in verse 5, he says, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will see. Christ will change people. Do you understand me? When when you become a believer, you're a changed creature. You're a new creature. That, That old person is gone. Stop letting that person creep back into your life. Why? Because when he creeps back into your life, that's when your joy will leave you. Your joy is in knowing that I'm not that person. For me personally, I'm not that guy on December 11th, 1998. I'm not that guy. I celebrated 22 years on December 11th. I'm not that guy. That that craziness in my life is not going to change who I am today because it is Christ himself who has changed me. And so we look at that verse. He says, he will change people in such a way that they will be able 
to see and they will be able to hear. People who are non-believers, look at our country today. I'm not going to get political. Maybe. But people are blinded. And each side of the aisle is saying the other one is blinded. Who is right and who is wrong? My, my charge or my, 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 my feeling as it relates to that is that the only one who's right is Christ Jesus. And if our relationship is secured within that uh, uh, spectrum, then all this other stuff, it doesn't matter. The left can't steal my joy. The right can't steal my joy. The circumstances of all of this cannot steal my joy. Because Christ is who gives me joy. And so, as we look at this, he is literally uh, going uh, to uh, allow in this millennial time for people to be able to see and to hear. People who had never seen before in their lives will see. People who had never been able to hear will hear. People who were mute and had never been able to speak before will be able to speak. That's the promise of what God has given to each and every one of us. In verses uh, 6 and 7, he says that then the lame will leap like a deer. You see, when we move into the, the New Testament, what do we see? We see the miracles or the signs that Christ performs so that we have an understanding of what is yet to come. We read about it today. He made the lame walk. He made the blind to see. He made the deaf to hear. Isaiah is talking about it in the future, in the second coming, as God will call his nation to, uh, back together. He will call his chosen people. All those who are in the fold will come back and see and experience the joy of eternity that has been promised throughout history in the Word of God. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a joyful kind of place right now. I, I am. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. I've had a week this week. Trust me when I tell you. My wife can tell you. Woo, it's not been a good week. And at the same time, I rejoice in knowing that Christ is, has saved me. And that the, 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 the difficulty that I might have this week is, is irrelevant to what it is that we, is yet to come. Right? So we look at that. If you want to see all the things will become perfect in, in verses uh, 6 and 7, the Messiah Jesus will make all of this happen. People want to say, well, you know, he's just kind of projecting. Here's what I want you to do. I didn't tell Linda about this. But um, if you go back, we won't do it uh, this morning, but I'm going to tell you on your le at your leisure, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and read verses 1 through 14. You will understand what I'm talking about as it relates to verses 6 through 7 in Isaiah 35. What? Deuteronomy chapter 28 roughly the first six or so verses alone, those are the Beatitudes of the Old Testament. So when you go to the Beatitudes in, in the Gospels and you read the Beatitudes, you will see the Beatitudes from Deuteronomy chapter 28. Blessed are. Right? He ties, you think that there's two different things going on. Everything is together. We cannot have joy only in the Old Testament. We cannot have joy only in the New Testament. We can only have joy because Christ is the one who brings the two together. That's, that's how it works. I know what I was like when I was separated. And, and, and the change, the metamorphosis that took place when I was no longer separated. I, I talked to my friend Ayub, not, not, not while I'm here, but when I get to visit, and we sit and we discuss all the theological issues that are at bay. And I say, look, the great thing for me personally is that I can get up and I leave. You're here. And if you haven't experienced a, 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 a South African prison, it is not a pretty situation. 
and yet he continues to find joy because of his relationship with Christ. In verses 8 through 10, we are exposed to this highway that I guess for lack of a better term, we can call the highway to heaven. All right? what, what Christ is going to do in his reign when he comes back, it's not going to be some narrow road that we're going to be walking on. It is going to be this great, great highway that we'll be able to go along and get to where? To Zion. Where? To Jerusalem. That is God's house right there. And, and it's not for those who are non-believers. I mean, the scriptures say very, very succinctly, a highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not wander on it. The lion, no lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. So this idea of, of having to travel on a road and, and be scared about anything, no. It, it, this is where the, the rubber meets the road, okay? This is where it, it, it happens. You, you either choose to believe in Christ or you choose not to believe in Christ. And in his coming... There is not going to be a second chance. And that is the issue that needs to be dealt with as believers today and why we do what we do. Go therefore, right, to the ends of the earth to make disciples in all nations so that they might know the choice that they have to believe or not to believe. I'm not there to save anybody. You're not there to save anybody. You're there to be obedient to what God has called us to do, which is to share the gospel, and you will see and experience the joy in your life. It'll be joy in your house, a house of joy because of the obedience of you specifically. No, it, it, it's a highway uh, to holiness. Non-believers will not be there. No vicious beasts. The redeemed will walk on it. The redeemed. Those of us who are believers. Gladness and joy. There's that word again. Gladness and joy are what should be expected. House of joy. We've experienced this idea of hope. Even in the craziness of of the world, we know that there is hope in Christ. We experience it. We experience a type of peace that somebody who does not know Christ can't possibly understand. It's not something that you can necessarily articulate, okay, to somebody who does not want to break the wall down and receive the peace that Christ is willing to give you. Because most people today, even believers, are thinking in the here and now. They're not thinking in what is yet to come. And and that's why this first point is the joy to come. We can look into the future with Isaiah. We can experience this incredible joy today in knowing what is yet to come, even though our circumstances might not be ideal. And so we look at all of that. Gladness and joy are what should be expected. Verses 3 and 4. We're going to go back to 3 and 4 now in our second point, which is joy in life today. Look at what Isaiah writes in chapters, uh, verses 3 and 4. It says, Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, Take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. We know that Christ is coming back. We know that he's coming back with a vengeance. But those who are believers will be lifted up. What do we need to do today? We need to encourage one another. Isaiah was speaking to those 
of his day, right? Just as he's speaking to us in our day. God will save those who are in need. Call his name. Call his name. I beg of you, if any of you are sitting and thinking to yourself, it can't be for me, I'm telling you, it's specifically for you. Specifically for you. And so what he says here, he says that he, what he was doing was encouraging the remnant to live according to God's way. Encourage the depressed. Share the good, no, the good news. People are really scared right now. All you have to do is go on, um, go on social media and just read some of the posts. People are really scared of the unknown. For those of us who are in Christ, we know what's to come. So there should not be any fear. Yeah, there's always concern about our circumstance, but I'm talking about fear. And we have to lift one another up in such a way um, that we are really encouraging those who are depressed. I read posts from people that I know, they're, they're scared out of their wits. If you got with Susan, she'd sit and tell you as a counselor, all the people that are coming to her right now out of depression, out of being scared, out of all of the issues that are going on in our day today. And why? Because they are not looking to what it is that Christ has promised. They're not. And so we go through this idea, God will save those who believe they will be delivered. And that's the message that we must bring to everyone. We talked about this idea of Christ coming back with a vengeance a second time. But as we celebrate this holiday season, we are celebrating the actual birth of Christ before his ministry. We, we talked about John the Baptist, who was the forerunner, how he opened up the way for Christ to come through, to share, so that we might know that he truly is God incarnate, that he is the Savior of the world. We looked in our Bible study at the Gospel according to John this past Wednesday. And what did we talk about? We talked a lot about the I Am statements within the Gospel. That this was a Gospel not so much revolving around, look at what I saw, but revolving around the idea that the message of Christ is for the entire world. That this message is a message of hope. That it is a message of love that the, the person and main uh, character of our story is God incarnate, that it is Jesus Christ, that he truly is God. This message through the gospel according to John is a message of deity of the Savior of the world. That's what we need to be focused in on. That's where we're going to draw, uh, draw our joy from. It is through this idea that Jesus Christ has come, that he has lived, that he has died, that he has rose on the third day, and yes, he is coming back a second time to claim his people. Our third point this morning is joy, the joy of Mary to God. So if we flip all the way over to Luke uh, chapter 1, verses 47 uh, through uh, 55. And Mary said, verse 46, I'll start there. And Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord. My soul exalts the Lord. Oh my goodness, you know that she is enthralled, engulfed, and a part of what it is that God is going to do. And my, my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for, for the humble state of his bond slave. 
She's a bond slave. You remember that term, bond servant. Paul says and calls himself a bond servant. She is 100% committed to being a slave for God. Are we? We call ourselves servants of the Lord, but we're hoping to break out sometimes. Right? She recognizes that in her day and age, and why they use that term, is that people who were enslaved had the opportunity to buy their way out of slavery. She says, no, as a bond servant, there's no way out. I'm in. I'm in 100%. There's no getting me out of this slavery. This is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I want to be doing. And I pray to God that the joy that I receive will be in the fact that he uses me to bring glory and honor to the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Okay. We're in the third week of Advent. I didn't know if I told you that yet. I'm excited about this stuff. Right? God noticed Mary. He noticed her. Not that she was perfect, but noticed the fact that she was someone who understood, even at her young, tender age, understood the Scriptures. Her spirit rejoiced in God, her Savior. She recognized, as all of us should recognize, that we need a Savior. We need a Savior. You cannot save yourself. Not for eternity. You might be able to save yourself and get out of a situation, but you cannot save your eternity lest you go through Christ Jesus. John 14, 6 is specific. Go look it up. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one shall come to the Father but through me. There is no other way. Mary understands this. He noticed her as a bondservant to him. Are, are, are you living a life, and I, I got to speak to myself in situations like this, are we living our lives as bond servants to Christ that Christ might look upon us that God the Father might look upon us through Christ Jesus as being yeah whoo there's one of my bond servants hello I'm digging that one or are you just kind of surface living we we, we got to become bond servants I'm the first one in line. I, I know it. I know it. Okay? And so look at that in your life. The joy of Mary to God. Why? Well, all gen generations will know this about her. That she was somebody that God used. She was a conduit. She was not somebody to worship. Otherwise, Scripture would have, would have noted it. But it doesn't. God used her that he might be God-man, fully man, fully God, the God-man that is the Savior of the world. That was her role. Nothing beyond that. She, she was uh, his mother as a man. She was not his mother as God. Scripture is very clear about that. But all generations, and as we see today, all generations will know about Mary because of how important she was. Her words were like those of Hannah. She prays like Hannah. <clears throat> and, and, and it's important. It's this whole, this whole thing called the Magnificat. If, it, look it up. I, I, we just, unfortunately, we don't have the time to, to rock through it. But Magnificat. And so, she knows the Old Testament, and here's the reality. God likes that about her. He likes it. Do you know the scriptures? I have conversations with people all the time. I wish I knew scripture more. My wife says to me, hey, come on, you know, you know, every time I say something, you know exactly where it is. I, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know anything. I don't know anything. I, I just get to stand up here and rant and rave. I learn every day I'm learning how much I don't even know. Why do I make even a statement like that? Because it, it drives me 
to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And we, as collective believers together, we should be thriving over the Word of God. Not waiting for somebody like me or somebody else to stand in the pulpit to tell you what it is that's in the Bible. You should be testing the word that is being preached to you against the scripture. But if you don't know the scripture, you can't test it. That's why so many people fall away and do what? They listen to nonsense that's being preached. Heretical preaching that takes place. Because why? Because we're not in the word. And it is so easy for us to be swayed as the wind moves direction. You can't have joy like that. People go from one religion to another, whether it's a new age rocks on your back or, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid and all the other nonsense that goes on. How could you have joy? You know that if they're going from one to the other, there is no joy in their life. The only joy is in Christ Jesus. Mary, in her young state, had infinite wisdom in knowing that it was God and God alone. And in that moment, knowing that the, that the Spirit was going to uh, uh, fill her up, and she was going to have to deal with the repercussions of people thinking that she uh, did things that she should not have been doing, she still found joy in knowing, I report to God. I don't report to anybody else. I report to God. And, and that really is a humongous, humongous difference. In, in verses 49 through 50, God is all-powerful, right? Take a look at this. And this is the beauty of what's happening as we celebrate his coming. Why we can have joy. Why? Because he's all powerful. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. This is Mary, right? And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. Read a little bit further. But God is all-powerful. God uh, glor glorifies God uh, for his power. Glorifies God for his mercy. Glorifies God for his holiness. This is what we should be praying every day. God's glorified because of his mercy upon us, no matter what the circumstance is. And I look around our sanctuary, I know, I know. And yet his mercy covers us completely. His grace covers us completely. His power covers us completely, no matter what. That is the Savior of the world that is to come. Listen, in verses 51 through, uh, 51 through 53, God is sovereign. He's sovereign. He humbles the proud. And trust me, I say this, maybe not in our lifetime, maybe, you know, we see glimpses of it, but God is going to humble the proud. They're going down. They're going down hard. They're going to go down fast. And they're going to be wiped from the face of the earth. Fact. He exalts the lowly. When you think about what Christ did in his ministry and calling those, he didn't say, I came to, to, to uh, talk to the guys that aren't sick. He goes, I, I came to make well those who are sick. I didn't, I'm not looking to save people that are already saved. I'm looking to do what? To save the lost. I'm looking to lift up the lowly. I'm looking to make things happen so that people all across the spectrum might know the power of the gift that is being given to each and every one of us. He exalts the lowly. In verses 54 and 55, here's the deal. God is faithful. No matter what you might think, 
You know, today, in, in today's day and age, part of the problem that we have and why we're experiencing what we're experiencing uh, as a whole through media and everything is that people are not convinced that there is truth. They're not convinced that there is truth. So if there is no truth, then anything goes. And that's what's, what's taking place today. We know that the word of God is truth because he's told it, told us so. We know that the word of God is truth because it has lasted, not just for the 2,000 years that Christ burst out onto the scene, but there are 4,000 years before that that God made himself known to all. The truth is God. The truth is knowing that if you take a historical uh, train ride, you will see that he, in all that he has done, has been faithful from the beginning until today and will continue to be faithful in all that he does. He humbles the proud. I'll say that again. And he keeps all his promises. His past faithfulness gave hope and gives hope to the future. I have a fan out there, and I am so excited. Somebody is giving me an amen, right? That's, a, you know, for those of you watching, you might not hear that, but I've got a bunch of amens um, from absolutely the cutest of all the cutes. Um, so, his past faithfulness, I'll say this one more time, gave hope, gave hope to the hopeless and gives hope today to those who are in need of hope. We see joy in our lives and, and sometimes it seems as though uh, we will never have it. I say we see, but we seek joy in our lives. And sometimes it seems as though we will never have it. Because we're defining joy on a man's spectrum, not on God's gifting and promises. God's word is specific about the joyful promises that he has made. And Isaiah spoke of, of the times that will come when our king triumphantly returns, and Mary spoke of the impending joy of the birth of the Savior of the world. And no matter what your circumstances are, listen, really listen, okay? God's promises are eternal. It, it doesn't matter what happens today, next week, a month, or a year from now. God's promises are eternal. And that's what we need to be focused on. Hey, listen, this might be a difficult time for you. The holidays, as they come in, and Christmas, and frustration, a lot of people have a difficult time uh, now. Uh, during uh, this season. And so, if this is a difficult time for you, I want you to know that God has prepared a house of joy for each and every one of us. Don't, don't, don't let people steal that from you. God's promises are real. God's promises are everlasting. And He never, ever breaks a promise. If you have come here this morning and have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I want to say to you this morning that there is this incredible joy that you can experience by stepping out of darkness and into the light. He, he's welcoming you. It doesn't matter where you've been. What matters is where you're going. God wants you to go with him. He's willing to wash us clean. How? by the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord and Savior of our lives, Jesus Christ. He, he, he is the one who has washed us clean. He wants to do that for you. Today. Right now. Not tomorrow. Not later. Nothing like that. Right now, in this moment, in this time, let's bow our heads. Father, I pray, God, that if there is one who is watching or here this morning, listening, 
that if today is their day of salvation, God, I pray that you would prick their hearts in such a way that they might know it is time to step out of the darkness and into the light and joy of knowing that their eternity can be secured with you by simply confessing with their mouth and believing in their heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, walked amongst us, rose up on that uh, day to ascend and sit at the right hand of our God and Father. That if we would just turn from our wicked ways, admit that we are sinners, that we will be saved. I pray and ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, if I can get there. Second Corinthians, I believe it's 2 Corinthians chapter 9. chapter 9, verse 7, God says this to us. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart. God gives us this incredible gift of joy, but he also tells us to give back, that we might exhibit that joy to him. And in this verse, he goes on to say that not grudgingly, we're under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We're, we're, we're not passing a plate these days for obvious reasons, um, but you can give, um, you, you can give to Sawdust Road in the ministry uh, that we're doing uh, by simply going to our website at sawdustroad.org and go hit that give tab. You can give through PayPal or you can give through your debit card, however you choose to do that. Or if you're here in the sanctuary, there's a receptacle on the wall. I want you to think about what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians and not do it out of compulsion, but do it with a cheerful heart in knowing that God is working mightily through the ministry here at Sawdust Road. I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful uh, week. I'll see you Wednesday for Bible study. And um, I'm glad that you've chosen to worship with us. Uh, be in prayer. One last thing. Be in prayer. Uh, we have posted for a position uh, on the Southern Baptist Convention uh, job uh, site. Uh, we have posted for a youth pastor. Um, and we're going to begin the process of, of growing up this church again. Um, and knowing that in 2021, God's got something really special planned for us. If you know somebody who would be interested and wants to apply for the position, by all means, have them send me a resume, pastorlenny.srbc at gmail.com. But the uh, posting is on the Southern Baptist, uh, it's sbc.net job board. And um, you can find uh, that under Sawdust Road and Youth Pastor. Uh, so be in prayer that we find the right man uh, to come and help us to grow this place up again. I love you guys in the Lord. Susan and I together love you all in the Lord. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Enjoy your families in this yucky weather. And uh, I will see you all Wednesday night and then Sunday next week. Thank you. You are dismissed. <laughs>